Today we're going to be kicking off the uh, Computer Science Distinguished Lecture Series for uh, the calendar year of 2016. Uh, today it's my pleasure to be introducing uh, George Varghese, uh, who's from Microsoft Research. Uh, prior to that, he held academic positions at uh, Washington University in St. Louis, as well as uh, University of California in San Diego. Uh, George, um, I think the best way to characterize him is that he's an embodiment of the word synergy, uh, in my opinion, in that uh, his research has shown the power of collaboration across traditional boundaries, that his areas in networking and systems, and uh, he's been able to achieve uh, dramatic results by collaborating with folks in programming languages, in databases, uh, algorithms, and computer theory, uh, combining ideas from these various disciplines, applying them to networking applications, and then achieving uh, tremendous results. Uh, and, and perhaps as, as a result of, of these great achievements, he's been awarded with um, several awards. I'm not going to name all of them, but two of them that are, are very prestigious are the um, a SIGCOM uh, Lifetime Achievement Award uh, for sustained and diverse contributions to network algorithmics with far-reaching impact in both research and industry. And then the uh, Koji Kobayashi Award, uh, which is uh, from IEEE, for contributions to the field of network algorithmics that is applications to high-speed packet networks. And these awards are awards that are shared by some of the uh, most famous people in networking, uh, including uh, fathers of the internet, Vint Cerf, who will uh, actually be a subject of uh, the <laughs> title of the talk today, uh, as well as uh, people like Tim Berners-Lee, the inventor of the World Wide Web. Uh, so this tells you the kind of caliber we're talking about. Indeed, somebody who is definitely dis distinguished and, and, and deserving to be uh, the <coughs> kickoff lecture in the CS Distinguished uh, Lecture Series. Uh, George Bargais, thank you. So it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Mike. And uh, I'd like to talk to you today, if I may, about what might happen if. Oh, yes. Oh, I turn it on. Good I Turn it on? I, I, I do. Hello? Yeah. Yes. So I'd like to talk to you today about what might happen if the world of <coughs> programming languages and <coughs> verification, symbolized by Tony Hoare, who thinks of programs as mathematical objects, met the world of networks, symbolized by Winserv, who likes TCP IP code and bits and bytes in the header, right? in order not just to think about networks in a new way, but to build tools, useful tools, for various kinds of networks. Uh, this is joint work with a lot of collaborators, uh, uh, which I articulate at the end of the talk. But for now, let's, uh, uh, let's move on. OK, um, where is the? Uh, <laughs> got it. Thank you. OK. Just for the non-networking people, let me introduce some terminology that will help you as I go on through this talk. So from my point of view, a network is a collection of routers, these boxes, interconnected by links in order to connect up entry points like engineering to exit points like accounting. So uh, networks basically ferry messages called packets. And uh, these packets are what you get when you take a video trap piece of the video transferring a video, you cut it up into these little messages called packets, each of which has a header. Okay. The header, from our point of view, the most important pieces of the header are the destination internet address and some part in the so-called TCP header, it doesn't matter what it is, that decides what kind of application it is. Okay? And there's also a source internet address. <coughs> so those are headers. And I'm going to abstract a router as a collection of rules. A rule is a set, each rule is a predicate on bits in the packet. If these bits match certain values, and an action, which tells you whether to drop a packet or to forward it to a certain interface. 
The majority of rules are what are called prefix rules, like 1.2.star, right, where each byte represents 8 bits, and the entire internet address is actually 32 bits. And 1.2.star means every internet address that begins with 1.2, right, matches that particular predicate. And in that case, this rule says forward to the right. But it's longest matching prefix, so when, you, when the packet gets to the second router, if the packet starts with 1.2.3, it's actually sent to the lower interface and not to a counter. Okay, so longest match is the workhorse, right? Rules are the workhorse of the internet. But what makes life exciting and causes uh, more trouble are these so-called access controllers. So people realize as the internet grew up that they needed to steer traffic in a much more fine-grained way based on the kind of traffic it is. So for example, going to accounting, you probably don't want SQL packets because they could access your accounting databases. You might want to drop them. right? And people do various kinds of rules. And these rules are set up manually. While these rules like 1.2.star are actually done automatically by a routing protocol. <coughs> The combination of these manually set up rules, as well as these longest matching rules, right, are actually a source of great complexity. And there's another source of complexity called load balancing, which I'm going to ignore for now. But just these two can cause enough damage, as, we, as this little parable will illustrate. Okay, so in a cloud that I know of, the following incident occurred. And you have to see the setup first. So the cloud consisted of compute servers, and these little boxes with crosses are routers. And the intent of the, 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 the policy that they wanted to enforce was that internet hosts, like that laptop up there, should be able to communicate back and forth to these compute servers, because that's what they were for, right? They're in the cloud, right? Now, the right way to have done this would have been, if you could have done it, would have to be enumerate every pair that is allowed, right? In that big uh, router called B. But that's too many. There's too many internet addresses, and there's too many of these too. And most of these routers have limited rule sets. So they play these games using these catch-all rules. So for example, an obvious catch-all rule at B is allow anybody from the internet to talk to C. What does C mean? It's the prefix which, could, which is common to all of these addresses. Right? So that's a very shorthand way of saying allow anybody from the internet to talk to this compute cluster, and vice versa. This was all very well, but on February 8th, some routine security testing noticed that people from the internet could actually send a packet to the router. And there was a particular pernicious attack based on a protocol called UDP. We could send this one-time crafted packet and, and get the, and it didn't happen, but it set up panic. People were sending email, very, very famous people, people who were vice presidents were saying, we need to do something about it. And so they very quickly, in the middle of the night, and what do you expect, right? They went ahead and set up this following rule. They said, deny anybody from the internet to talk to C if they're using the so-called protocol called UDP. You don't have to know what UDP means. But the, all you need to know is that the regular protocol used TCP because it was back and forth communication, but this one was UDP, so it should block the bad guys and let the good guys through, right? Well, not quite. It turned out that there's something called the domain name service which uses UDP, and, that was, and therefore regular traffic customers started complaining. And that was much worse, right? Because customers at 2 a.m. Is, is even more. And so this kind of manual back and forth reasoning goes on all the time, alternating between leaving dangerous security holes and leaving sort of wide swaths of the network disconnected, right? And this actually happens everywhere to all the clouds that you know of, right? So really the problem is testing doesn't quite work. There's one or two packets that could cause this trouble, and the space of packets we are looking for is about 2 to the 100. 32 bits of the source internet address, 32 bits of the destination address, and 16, and 16 bits for the TCP fields that actually go ahead and tell you the application. So that's about 100 bits. Searching through the space is hard by testing and random testing. Okay? It's exacerbated by sheer scale, the diversity, and also the rapid changes by which we are constantly rolling out new clusters. It's not just us. You might think, oh, Microsoft. They don't know how to do things, right? But we did a third of the respondents we surveyed had very similar problems. Google has problems. United Airlines shut down flights because of these things. And to me, though, what really brings this home is we at Microsoft are taking our crown jewels, which is Office, and moving it from disk to Office 365. If we don't get our network right, it will significantly diminish our revenue, and even our CEO will care, right? So. <coughs> 
So even simple questions are hard to answer today. Not just which packets from A can reach B, but also is even more fancy ones like is group X provably isolated for students and faculty? I don't know. Uh, is the net to more from booleans to more quantitative <coughs> ones? Is the network causing performance problems or is it the server? Right? Why is my backbone utilization poor? And so the thesis is that. While we might dislike the state of affairs today, and say this is so unclean, so bad, it's there, and we need to quickly, urgently build these bottom-up analysis tools of existing systems while we wait for perfect designs. And that's really what I want to talk to you about today. So now we know that formal methods, which really amount to checking all cases, as opposed to testing, which checks some cases, right, have worked to some extent in programs and hardware. So why not use formal methods to, to search through this large space of headers, through the 100 headers, right? And can we do it? Because it seems a little large, right? And that's really the question I want to ask you today, OK? And in order to answer this question, I'm going to break it up into three parts. First of all, all of you probably have heard of classical verification tools like model checkers and SAT solvers. So you must first be wondering, why can't he just roll out the IC3 model checker and, and apply it to this network? We tried. It doesn't work, right? <laughs> it barely scales to extremely small networks. And in, in addition, when a model checker fails today and find, when you make an assertion and it gives you a counterexample, it's one counterexample. We want all the headers that cannot, that can actually reach a bad place, right, or when it shouldn't. And so we are going to, in the first part, I'm going to describe to you a simple technique very quickly called header space analysis, which scales to medium-sized networks and gives you all counterexamples. But the trouble about it is that in the end, it can do one pair in a second. When we went to Microsoft, we realized we had 100,000 stations, 100,000 pairs, and we needed to do better. And so with Gordon Plotkin, we, just, we worked on something to exploit symmetries in networks, because there are quite a lot of these very great symmetries. And if you're holding your nose at this point, thinking all oh, this stuff is so dirty, I'm going to talk about the future, how we might reverse the process and design networks to, by synthesis, right? So we don't have these problems in the first place. So we have correct by construction networks. All right? Is this okay? The plan? All right, so let me talk about header space analysis. So in header space analysis, we are, uh, <coughs> this is work with a student at Stanford uh, who, uh, who later founded a company based on this. And he is, uh, uh, and it basically allows you to navigate these large header spaces. So we have these boxes. And part of the problem in networking is we have very different boxes. We have Cisco routers, Juniper firewalls, some other load balancers, and various other boxes. And you've seen some in your homes and some in the network. Now, SURF would think of a box as really a set of match rules followed by actions. What is a match rule? You could abstract this as just predicates on the bits, where I use zeros and ones for which where you have to match those values, and x's for I don't care. So this is a packet within a certain position. Let's say bit one matches zero. I don't care about these two and one in the fourth bit and so on. And now you go ahead and do an action. But even this is somewhat abstract because it's abstracted across the diversity of manufacturers and firewalls versus routers. But it's not very mathematical, so it's hard to reason about. Okay, so instead, right, Hoare might think of it and follow. Think of every bit as a dimension. And now you have the 100 bits that matter to forwarding from a 100-dimensional space. If you also anchor each space with the interface where it's at, rules take basically spaces anchored at one interface and transform them to spaces anchored at another space. Right? And now a router, the so-called rules in them, become guarded commands. If you match this subspace A, then go ahead and forward it to the subspace A prime. A prime because you might rewrite the packet. Okay? So you change it. And similarly, if you match B prime, B then go to, then go to B prime. So the router is now abstracted of all its fiber optic cables and all the other hardware stuff, and it's just a program. If you can compose all of these to make a network program, the network becomes a program. So why is this interesting? At this point, we can ask ourselves why we can't use traditional programming languages techniques, we can, why we can't build static checkers, why we can't build debuggers, 
why we can't build uh, synthesizers or compilers, right? And so there's a whole generative program that this suggests. For now, though, I want to do a very simple thing. I'm just going to try to build a static checker. Okay, but hold that thought, and I'll try to come back to it later. All right, so, so this is, okay, so as you said, packets are just points in this zero, L-dimensional space, which could be zero, one, or wildcard, right? Packets don't, can, don't have wildcards. And we are collapsing all the layers. Have you guys may have heard of things like Ethernet and IP and TCP? We don't care. We just push them as a bunch of bits, right? But this more interesting part is we're going to abstract every router as a transformer of the header space. Now, this geometric view, which is that it's a transformer of one space to another, <laughs> is very nice visually and suggestive. But when you want to work with it, it's better to use algebra. So it's easier to use a so-called transfer function to abstract a router. A transfer function is a set of tuples of a header, which includes wildcards, and an interface. And it maps it to a set of headers and interfaces. Why a set? Because we want to model things like load balancing. So this really means it could go to any of these. And you could also use it for multicast, but it's, it's somewhat schizophrenic. For now, just take out multicast from your, from your uh, heads. Right? But it's mapping a set of, so each rule <coughs> is basically saying prefix at this port, and then map it to a, to a, a potentially after rewriting to another form of that prefix to the, and ACL is also another sort of header, sort of wildcard expression and an interface. Is that clear? Okay. So now we can put this model to work, right? But before we do that, there's a couple of things. It turns out that we have to actually, the model is compositional. Okay, if you've done formal work, you realize you have to work a little hard to make it compositional. But it means that if you want to find out what happens to a packet when it moves across three routers, R1 to R3, you could simply compose all the functions, right? The transfer functions of each of the routers. So maybe I, should, I went a little too fast. So the problem was I have three routers, and I want to figure out what happens to the packet when it comes across those three. And it's basically, it's simply the composition of the transfer functions of all of the routers in the cloud. Okay. It turns out that because you rewrite packets, the packet that emerges may not be the packet that you put in. So you need to invert two. So some, you also need, to, for every output packet, you need an inversion function that tells you the input packet that you produce. And finally, you can endow this space with some simple operators, right? Union, difference, and, uh, and, and, and intersection. So what is intersection? Think of a set of packets as a ternary string of ones, zeros, and wildcards, OK? Suppose I want to intersect two sets of packets. You just go bit by bit. If you get a bit intersected with itself, one with one, zero with zero, you return the bit. Or a bit intersected with the wildcard is just a bit, one intersected with star. The only interesting case is you get a one and a zero in the same place. But that's clearly impossible, right? So in that case, we return the value z, which is that can't work. And if you get a z anywhere, <laughs> In this bit by bit intersection, you declare them a space node. And that's union. And that's intersection, sorry. And you can get union similarly, right? And then set difference follows. Okay, so these operators are very simple. The simple operators. Okay, so what's the point of all of this? What's the original problem? <coughs> we have a network, Cisco firewalls, Juniper boxes, all kinds of crazy things. And the first thing we do is we write, we read at first. We read all the tables, the forwarding table, the spanning tree table, various, and we convert them to this header space representation. This is an intermediate form. Okay. Now, we also are armed with some set of specs. Who should reach who for what kinds of packets? A can, customer virtual machines can reach, uh, you know, like DNS, but they cannot reach router ports. And now, we want to find out when we start sending packets from A to B, whether the packets that reach from A to B match the spec that's allowed from A to B. Is that a problem, okay? Okay, so, so it's, we do it in a very naive way, okay? And then we make it a little more efficient. We start by injecting the complete space of packets. Think of it algebraically as the wildcard expression all stars. And we send that at A. Now when we hit, hit the, then we make it match the transfer function at A, and it splits into two parts based on the transfer function, all packets that A can send through four, and all packets that A can send through three. 
Okay? And we keep doing this, almost like a simulation, which sounds really stupid, which it is, except that we are dealing with sets of packets. We're dealing with equivalence classes of packets that match <coughs> rules. So we're not dealing with each of the 2 to the 100 packets. We are actually dealing with sets. Okay? So what eventually reaches is the, the composition of the transfer functions on any path and the union across all paths. That makes sense? OK. Now, this is an incredibly naive algorithm. Why? Because we have an exponential number of paths, right, sometimes in networks, and many of them are never used. And also, if this header space breaks up into too many little pieces, then we get into trouble. So it, the secret, oh, sorry, there's one more step. After we do this, we have to invert to find the packets that were sent by A that actually reached B. And then we match it against the spec and say, does it work or does it not work? Right? So, yes? Is the spec known completely? We'll come back to that. No. <laughs> we'll come back. That's a very good question. But, but so it, it, there, there's, it's known approximately. So what we often do is do it iteratively. We go ahead and do it, and then we say, we don't say it's a bug. We say, what do you think? And then they say, oh, right, we forgot. This is a lot. Yes, you're right. Very good. OK. So how do we make this more efficient? So this trick to efficiency is this data structure, which is called a difference of hypercubes, where it's a hypercube is defined by a wildcard expression. A wildcard expression is a set of bits which up to L bits, where L is this upper bound, which has wildcards in some bits and ones and zeros in the other bits. You take a union of some of them, and then you take a set difference with the union of them. Why is this a natural representation? Well, start with the router and see what happens when you, the, for the packets that match this part. Now, if you do it naively, right, this is 2 to the 99 headers because it's all packets that match one star but do not match one zero star. Why? <coughs> because longest matching prefix and matrix. Packets that match one zero take over compared to this. Right? So, but that's a lot of packets, so it's very natural to represent it like this. That's difference notation. But that doesn't mean anything. If you start with difference notation, but it doesn't stay that way, it's not very helpful. So you have to see that it, that it continues. Okay? So what happens when it comes to this router? Let's look at the packets that go here. That's the stuff that matches this, intersected with the stuff that matches this. But that intersection distributes. And so when it distributes, you get, you, you, you get a difference again. So differences stay differences right, as they go through routers, which is very nice. Okay, there's one last problem. Look at, the, look at this set of packets. Clearly, every packet that matched 1, 0 should have been picked off here, and this space should have been null. But how do we know this? If we don't know this, we're hauling around all these empty spaces through the network, and that would be a bad idea. Okay? But if you look at it, 1 double star minus 1, 0 star intersected with 1, 0 star is 1, 0 star minus 1, 0 star. Right? And the simple heuristic we use is for every positive term, if there is a negative term that subsumes it, then we declare the space null. This is not complete, but it's a good heuristic, and it works well. And it often catches examples like this. Okay? And so it stops us propagating null spaces. OK. Yes? Can you clarify the meaning of uh, longest prefix matching? That one is, is very important in your analysis. Too. So. Right. So this is something that the way networks are built. This is part of IP, the Internet Protocol. What it roughly means is this. If you know of a more specific place to go, right, go there. So for example, if you have a rule that says, I know how to get to the CS department, that supersedes a rule to get to UCI. That's roughly where it is. That's the intuition. But it's just a, we're not doing anything new here. We're just, this is, we're just inheriting the standard networking practice. All right. Okay. Some of you have know about verification, and you know about classical structures like binary decision diagrams. How does our data structure differ from so-called BDDs? Okay, what we do is we have this simple hack where we code every bit 1 by 1, 0, 0 by 0, 1, the wildcard by 1, 1, and z, the null character, by, I'm sorry, star is 1, 1, and z is 0, 0. 
If you do this, then if you intersect bitwise after this encoding, right, you can go ahead and use standard bitwise intersection. You don't have to keep these rules and say, if it is this, do this. And this is very fast. It is what we call word parallel. Okay? So it's, you can basically take two header expressions and you can intersect them in parallel. Let's do this. And that's really fast. It's roughly order one. BDDs, if you don't know what them, don't worry about them, but they're the classical workhorse. They're like a tree of bits, right? Which, and you have to walk these two trees so it's like order L squared. So that's one reason why we are so much faster, is because we have these structural things. Now, BDDs are very useful because they map more general functions, right? It's because there are restrictions in our domain that we can do this, okay? So this is the key message. Classical verification, sort of, we have a lot of simplifications that allow us to do things much simpler, right? For example, we have things like, we have very few writes, we have no cycles, because packets shouldn't loop in the expected case. In a regular program, loops are a good thing, right? Without loops, you wouldn't have programming. And so for us, it's not really something that should happen, so we often check for loops. The diameter is small. And therefore, we can do these much faster things than using classical verification. Okay? So we basically <coughs> compared it against on a famous benchmark or the standard benchmark. And we compared it against the best model checkers, the best SMTs, kind of extended to all solutions, and even replacing our analysis with this workhorse structure called BDDs. And we found that we completed in, uh, in seconds, and we have extensive results. And this is just four. We have like hundreds of results. And the model checkers you know, are within sometimes time out, but they're within a factor of four, but they give you only one packet header that fails. We get you all. The sad ones that do all are much bigger. Okay, so, so this is roughly the kind of reinforces the lesson that exploiting structure helps you. Gone too fast? Lost you guys? All right. So good uh, question. Yes. So in the, in the, the uh, experiment, there were 13,000 rules. Yes. Actually, the technique, is there some limitation on the expressibility of the rules that can be represented in the mechanism you've got, or is this, uh, does it apply to any rule language? No. It's, this is very much specific. I think difference of cubes is very specific to networking and ACLs, and so I wouldn't try to use it. So we, we found maybe just the some programming analysis pro that it, but it's very, very restricted. BDDs are much more general. So it's not surprising that we can beat BDDs. So there's no free lunch. Yeah. All right. So some of you might know that I work for MSR Silicon Valley. And one day, they fired everybody, right? Except for some people. And uh, it turns out that Gordon Plotkin, who's one of the founders of Structured Operational Semantics, a logician, right, was wandering around, <laughs> and he had nothing to do. So one of the nice side effects of the firing was that we began to talk, right? <laughs> and so, you know, I can't recommend this as a method for <laughs> promoting research, but nevertheless, you know, it was helpful, right? And so we began to worry about the scaling problem for verification, right? Now, it seemed like the first part said we could do things fast. But really what it did is we could do one pair in seconds, right? But we have 100,000 hosts. 100,000 square is a big number. And when we did this on our large data centers, we found five days. And that's not very exciting, right? Because you had a bug. Five days later, you come around and say, oh, right, there was a bug. <laughs> you know, it's a little passe. So the question we want to ask is, can we exploit regularities in data centers in order to make this faster? <clears throat> now, look at our data center, our data centers. There are all these fat tree topologies. In particular, the routers at the same level are pretty much interchangeable. They're backups for each other. They're designed to be interchangeable. Right? One fails, you take them. So in particular, there's a notion of symmetry that you would like to formalize, that you could swap routers and things will be the same, right? And maybe you could exploit that. In particular, the goal would be to basically prove some kind of, we started by this goal. Could we reduce this fat tree to a thin tree where all the backups were replaced by one representative, right? And this seems simpler. And if verification complexity is proportional to the number of components, then you're doing better, right? That was our goal. All right. Now, there's a little bit of history here. 
The world of model checking, which you may not know, but doesn't matter, right, had this notion of symmetry maybe 30 years ago, but it's a little different. They do symmetry on the state transition graph. Okay, so let me explain what the state is. The state of a network is where a packet is, the header is, and at what interface it is, right? And you're looking for state transitions that take you to from A to another interface B, possibly rewriting to each prime. And the star says any number of any number of transitions go through any number of routers, and n is the network. So what we what classical symmetry does is it defines a mapping function pi, right? Such that if you apply pi to this, it, it's a mapping function from the state space onto itself. So that when you map every state, every transition that held true before holds true if and only if it holds in the map state. It's this classic definition of symmetry. But it's on the logical graph. But if you look at it, the state space factors into headers for us, because it's structure and interfaces. So we want to factor the symmetries onto the topology and the headers. So we want to go ahead, and if you don't understand the rest of the slide, tune out, and I'll draw you some pictures in a few minutes. Okay, so, all right. So we want to basically show that the original network is the same as the network quotiented by a group, but the group is on the physical topology. Okay, so let's see what that means. And we want to show that anything that was reachable before is true in this quotient network. Okay, so let's draw a picture. Forget about all this algebra. Okay, just get rid of this. Okay, so look at this network, right? Just look, right? Look at these two routers. They look so similar. So if we could swap them, but we also have to swap these links and swap these links, and then it's the same thing, right? We've just redrawn the network. Now, in that case, if we could do that, we could so-called do a division or quotienting operation in the group, right? The, the, by the way, what is the group? The group is the set of all components that can be interchanged. So quotienting just means you replace these two guys by a representative. That's it. Simple. <laughs> All the backups, like this one pseudo not. And similarly, these two links become one link. That's all quotient is. It sounds profound, <laughs> but it's not. Automorphism, this thing, blah, blah, blah. OK. But there is a fatal flaw in this argument. It assumes that these two routers are identical in every way, including their insights. Their rules have to be identical. But when we checked, we found in our data centers there was mild blemishes. There was local rules here, like a little local rule here or here, but it was different. So we had to do something a little more complicated. Okay. How do we deal with near symmetry? For near symmetry, we had to do symmetry at a finer grade. We couldn't do it at the box level. We had to do it at the rule level. So let's take a bunch of examples of rules, one example of rules, to forward packets to this destination x at all of these routers. Notice there's one, two, three, four, five, six, six rules for x in all these routers. What we're going to try to do is we're going to sort of remove redundant rules. They're going to work on the rule space. Okay? So notice that we don't, in order for, to check for reachability to x, we don't really care whether we get through here or here. Right? So we might as well get rid of all of these rules that are going through here. right? And, and we have a simpler network. We remove all those rules. And now four of, two of the rules have gone away. Why does this work? Right? It sounds like crazy. right? Why, why the heck was this here in the first place? It's here for quantitative reasons, like reliability, to allow more performance. But if you're dealing with Boolean questions, like reachability, it doesn't matter. That's the observation. If we had to, if we had to finesse this for quantitative questions, we had to do some aggregation operator. We had to put some number like two or something like that. But that's but let's avoid that. But once we do this, this rule is orphaned. It's useless because nobody is coming through this guy. So we might as well get rid of this. Okay. This stupid simple operation, which can be done in some kind of very simple data structure, like union fine data structure across rules, and we do this recursively in a few seconds, even these millions of rules can be quickly squeezed out, such that all the backup routers, we can squeeze out their rules, 
except leaving a residue of either these local rules that I said existed or buggy rules that should not, well, should have been equal. And that's really the key to this operation. Okay, so if you didn't care, <laughs> this is what happens. The header equivalence classes, that I remember there was two to the hundred packets that could be sent. It turns out that there are only 4,000, in our big data centers, there are only 4,000 equivalent packets. And an equivalence class means these packets are treated the same way. Why do you think that happens? Think about it. Every packet destined to the CS department in, is probably treated exactly the same way, unless it has some special feature, right, where there's video or something, and there was a rule for it. So it's not that surprising that human beings can't construct, right, all these equivalence classes. And our job is really un extracting the underlying simplicity, right, behind this. But the rule surgery, which I talked about, takes roughly a million rules in our data center and collapses it to about 10K. And now we've gone from 131 hours to two hours. <coughs> This is still not good enough, right? Because we really, two hours to detect a bug is too much. But we are pretty sure with a little bit of parallelism and some other things, we can get it down to one minute goal. And we do have, in Microsoft, a much simpler version of this tool running that the operators really rely on. Because they have been finding bugs every time they deploy their clusters. It's not quite as comprehensive as this. We need some scaling to get this down, right? But, but it catches a lot of bugs. And so you know, people are getting this religion. And we can now, we do, and we can do even more exhaustive periodic rapid checking of network invariants in these large operational networks. OK. So if you know a little bit about this stuff, yes. Actually, so you are essentially raising the abstraction level. Yes, yeah, totally. By, mer by merging, <coughs> establishing equivalent classes. Yes. But you really want people to do this when people lose some sort of capability of your debugging. With so respect to a spec. A spec. So with right. respect to the Boolean reachability spec, we're losing nothing. Mm -hmm. you know, it's yeah, not, it's completely lossless, right? Mm -hmm. It's not, uh, you're not losing anything, right? It's not an approximation of any kind. But if you want to go to quantitative specs, oh, yeah. which is okay. one of the things that are here, right, which is we want to go to components to quantitative, we are working on, we've done some, then we have to go careful. We have to kind of add things mm -hmm. and do other things. Okay. okay, so we've basically been uh, being constant. Uh, it turns out that, you know, I've sort of so far ignored the hard problem of the routing protocol, right, that builds these tables that we are verifying. And so we're trying to verify those two. Right? And uh, we've also done some runtime work where we, dis we make up a bunch of test packets. And I know some people here work on testing, and we've done that too. And so, uh, and some people have been doing this for extending this to state from stateful to, sta to, to stateless to stateful, and I don't want to talk about it. All right, so I have 20 minutes left. <coughs> and if you're tired of all this stuff and say, my gosh, this is all because of these dirty networks you guys are causing. OK, let's just prospectively take a moonshot and look at what, if we could design networks. And some of you may have heard of Tintin, some of you don't, but you don't, don't worry about it. But we want to just take a moonshot. We want to look forward and see how could we do things differently. OK, the first thing to notice is that in the future, even CEOs will be glad to optimize their data centers to, 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 to deliver services. Because services, if you reduce latency for Google or, or Amazon by about 10 milliseconds, you gain $100 million. They don't really care if you use TCP within the data center, as long as you speak TCP outside to customers, because they have other matters. So the data center is a big computer. So you can do what you please within the data center. Now, in addition, you have this bottom-up move where there's something called software-defined networks, and Broadcom is giving merchants merchant chips. Google builds their own routers, right? So this whole data center is becoming a big playground where you can do what you please. Now, to me, what it says is, if we couldn't get existing networks where nothing was moving, or maybe a few things were moving, you could say ACL is working, how in the world are we going to do this when TCP is up for grabs, IP is up for grabs, right? And it seems to me that we're going to have to synthesize these networks, right? And, uh, and the intellectual problems are going to move from logics, right, for correctness, like we did before. That's why Gordon was involved to things like synthesis and compilation and optimization. So now optimization problems are going to be interesting because you want to synthesize a network subject to constraints. All right. So my friend Nick McKeon sort of says that 
uh, drew this nice slide at, uh, at SITCOM where he said he contrasted the hardware design industry, which is very, very systematic. And it gets billion, dollar, billion chip transistors working. And it starts with a functional language. It has testing. And, and in the end, it goes ahead and uh, does some runtime stuff, which is called post-silicon debugging. And I have spent a lot of time trying to wonder what the corresponding layers would be for a similar network design automation industry. Okay, I don't want you to get too hung up on all of these, except that functional descriptions in RTL map to policy languages, test benches to testing, and we have test packets. But what we've done in this first part is verification. But what I really want to just dream about a little bit is synthesis. OK. Now, first of all, synthesis, right? there are two options. The biggest thing that we've talked about is given who can talk to who, Sharad, like the spec, which you don't really know, but nevertheless, can you synthesize the logical rules, the ACLs at every router? subject to some constraints. So many Cisco routers have only 700 rules. That's the inverse of the problem that I talked about so far. Why? The problem I talked about so far is, given these rules, right? tell me what the reachability is. So that itself is an interesting problem. People at Cornell and Princeton have done a lot of good work in it. I'm going to actually talk a little bit about synthesizing the insides of a router, the microcosmos. They're completely different, right? Because they're two complementary things. So far, I've assumed the insides were given. And, and now I want to talk about something closer to the hardware because I love routers. They're my friends. And so I, I kind of enjoy working on them. Okay. OK, so I want to talk a little bit about router synthesis. OK, so very briefly, right? What has happened in this, the old days, routers were fixed. You had fixed pipelines. and you could do a certain amount of programming in something called OpenFlow to write tables here, but you couldn't really change the hardware. <coughs> so in recent times, though, we found that people are constantly adding new headers. Okay, a classic example is something called VXLAN. Okay, how many of you have heard of virtualization? Okay, so virtualization required adding a new header called the VXLAN header. It took two years for it to come because chips have to be respun, and it took two years. We want an architecture that's more flexible, that we could add headers and move resources around. Okay? Now, what do you think of when you think in hardware in terms of flexibility? I know uh, we have some people here who work on FPGAs. You think of FPGAs, right? That is the answer to all the reconfigurability problems. So there's a little bit of, of subtlety here. If you plot performance and you plot reconfigurability, FPGAs are very reconfigurable. Right, in terms of design, but they have a speed limit. They go to about one terabit optimistically, maybe 100 gigabits. The Broadcom chips that we are trying to replace and make more configurable are 10 terabits. Right? Software processors are 100 gigabits. So what we are looking for, and what has happened, is we are looking for this new architecture, right, which is as fast as these fixed function chips, but less programmable than it. We don't want the full product. So we call this word we use is sufficient programmability. Okay, so this is roughly how we did it. Okay, many years ago, and this is a very schematic, very, very cartoonish, but it gives you some idea. <coughs> we tried to make some reconfigurable processor at a startup called Procket where we had a bunch of CPUs, get a crossbar switch, if you know what that means. It just can, it's like a telephone switch. And we had a bunch of memories. And if one CPU wanted more memory, right, we could go ahead and connect it to more memories. But the trouble is, in hardware terms, these are long wires. They go from one end of the chip to the other. Long wires mean long propagation delay, and that is slow clocks, and that's a problem. Instead, uh, with another team, we just we very recently, we, we, the RMT architecture has the memories and CPUs all in one stage. And now what we want to do is we have a, a parser so we can go ahead and add new packets and new headers. <coughs> and if we want to reallocate resources, right, to add, so we can go ahead and allocate, let's say, the IP processing to more stages. Roughly, that's roughly the idea of the RMT. But the main architecture is it's a pipeline with a lot of stages. Okay? Now, it turns out that this is hardly expensive. 
If you look at real chips in hardware, only 20% of the chip real estate is due to logic and wires. The remaining 80% goes to memories and transceivers. So adding a few percent of wires, right, doesn't cost you much. All right, all right, so, so basically now the new move in router processing is you logically specify a set of processing elements and tables and you have to map it onto this pipeline. So for example, the, this is the ethernet header and it may be processed in the first stage. The IPv4 header can be here, the IPv6 header, and it can also split things across stages. And so obviously, and I'm going to skip through this uh, so slides too. Okay, there is a new language to do this called P4, which is a very interesting language because it allows you to add new headers, it allows you to add new processing tables and a new control flow graph that tells you how to process these guys. The big point, though, is that if you are a programming language person, you should wake up at this point because there are new compiler problems. Okay? First of all, you have to map from these large, from these, these tables, these logical tables, into these physical tables at the stages, right? And that is akin to register allocation. I don't want to talk about that. But the more interesting problem is code generation. And I want to give you a little flavor of code generation. Okay, think of a new piece of code you want to deploy in a router. <coughs> a new header that is just looked up is no big deal. To make it interesting, we want some code that retains state between packets. So I have to give you a little example for that. So bear with me as I give you the example. Okay, so this is an example of load balancing that people have wanted to do. There is a source and it wants to balance load across these links. And the simplest strategy is send the packet, if there are many of them, to the, the lowest queue, the one which can least delay, that you see. The trouble about that is that TCP hates that. Because if the second packet overtakes the first packet, there's a FIFO violation. And for various reasons, TCP doesn't like that. Just let's not get into all why, right? Okay. So what people do instead is this little hack where they keep a little ID for the packet based on the source address. And they remember how long it's been since they saw it. Right? And if it's a long time gap, they switch to the new, new, the best route now. Otherwise, they stay with the old route. It's called flowlet switching. It's a simple little hack. Okay, so what's the, what's the problem for something like Alex, right? When, what's the compilation problem, the parallel compilation problem? You are given as input a piece of code that is like C code on a single processor. Can we call, and this very simple C code, which has no loops, and it has no pointers. So a lot of the hard problems go away, but never does. So here's this code. It's really simple. Let's read this. The first one chooses speculatively one of these links as a potential new hop that you're going to switch this packet to. Okay, but you have to be careful. You look at the ID as a hash. You compute the ID of, of the packet fields. And now you check whether this long enough time occurred. If long enough time occurred, you go ahead and you set it to this new hop speculatively. Right? And then you update last time. Is this code easy to understand? OK. How do we take this code, which works fine on a single processor, and map it to a set of parallel stages so we get this pipelining effect? So that we can, we can speed it up. Yes. All right. Very simple. Use standard compil compiler techniques to break this up into some kind of graph where each code has a, is a so-called basic block, and you put an arrow between blocks if there's a dependency, right? If, there are, if this code reads this variable called same top, then you put an arrow, it's called a read-write dependency. Now, you notice that these two code blocks depend on each other in a circular fashion. So a very standard compiler, compiler idea is to break up this graph of in this data flow graph, the, in the, this graph, into so-called strongly connected components. Okay? Notice that these guys depend on each other, so you can't put them on different stages. Because one guy should be before the other, but the other guy should be before the other, so the result is you've got to put them on the same stage. Okay? So once you do that, you go ahead and merge all these strongly connected components, and now you go ahead and just linearize this DAG using uh, any kind of topological sort. And now you assign them to stages. That's all you do. Okay? So it's a little more complicated than that, but that's roughly what you do. 
Okay, so there's one last catch here. It turns out that sometimes you've done, you've had this large strongly connected component, you've got to put it somewhere. You've got to assign instructions for it. All the other pieces of code, if you look at these other pieces of code here, okay, most of these pieces of code are very simple, equal to, and they map to standard risk instructions. It's this problem, it's the problem, sorry, it's the problem of this piece that can get fatter and fatter as you make the strongly component bigger and bigger. Okay? So we had to do something where we went ahead and we posited a so-called stateful instruction, and this looks very intimidating, <laughs> and I'm not gonna explain it, right? But it's a piece of hardware that is very general, and it has lots of variables, like, zero, like x, packet one, packet two, fields and packets, and inputs. And it can simulate a lot of functions. Right? How do we map the particular function we want to? Okay, so this is a little for the programming languages insiders, but we use a tool called Sketch, right? which allows you to fill in the gaps in a program and prove that the result actually verifies, actually always for all values of the input. So it turns out for this stateful component, we set p dot new hop here, the temp here, and the value of same top here, and Sketch gives us this automatically. So, so we do instruction generation by this new tool called Sketch, which I think I find kind of fascinating. Okay, so I'm going to skip this and get to it towards the end. Okay, so what's different? It turns out that people like Alex and their books, strongly connected components have been used for many, many years ago. But in standard compilers, the size of the strongly connected component of the in the in the dependency graph decides how fast you can pipeline. The bigger the strongly connected component, you have to slow down the issue instructions. We have a dual problem. We can't slow down the pipeline. Guess what we have to do now? We have to add more hardware to every state. So it's the duality between time and space, which is kind of fascinating. Okay? So let me, let me end up. And, uh, uh, and uh, I'm going to skip this little problem, because we have too little time. But uh, OK. So let me quickly relate it work, and then I'll end. It, formal methods were, uh, it, a lot of these problems of reach ability were pioneered by some people at CMU where they actually described the problem and how problems to be so complicated because of firewalls and ACLs, and that was done by Z et al. in CMU. The first use of formal methods were by people at UIUC. They built something called Anteater, right? And they did some really good work. Symmetry model checking <coughs> dates back from uh, if and nil. But by the way, the first few things were not scalable, so we scaled it better. Compiler methods, as I said, software pipelining is old, but it was basically concentrating on time and not space. And network synthesis, which is given a spec, figure out the rules, has been well addressed by people in Cornell, Princeton, and Brown. Okay, so these are famous results. Today. Okay, it's time to go on. Okay, so last three slides. Okay, hold on. It's almost over. Okay. So. What do I want to do, right? So it seems to me, I have this article of faith, that everything interesting in the programming languages world, right, that was done about seven to 10 years ago, has a corresponding paper <laughs> in network verification. And it's a useful thing. <coughs> there's something called certified development of an operating system, and there's been, seven years later, there's a, I'm sorry, oh, uh, there, there, is the, there is an SDN controller that is certified. So this is a provably correct piece of software. You know, ternary simulation, ternary simulation. The problem that Sharad was asking about, how do you mine specifications? There are corresponding papers in there. It's roughly, look at the gap, seven years, right? This seems like a field that's emerging, right? That I find that fascinating. Now that sounds like we just take stuff from seven years ago. This is great, right? Students' PhD thesis, very simple, right? Take a paper from seven years ago, right? Change all the names, right? To network, from program to network, and it's done, right? No, hopefully not, right? There, there is something to be done. There are stuff in the domain that you can exploit, right? So look at symmetry. We exploit symmetries in the physical topology. Look at turn header space analysis. We're taking advantage of stuff like limited negation, no loops, and sketching. You know, we're taking advantage of the fact that there are no loops. And, and so me, this suggests interdisciplinary work between PL folks, right? Networking and and even hardware guys, right? So not just not just whore and, and surf, but also a guy called Chuck Thacker who is pretty good at hardware. <laughs> okay, so the broader agenda for me is this, right? Is that 
There's a lot of work to be done. So far, I've totally ignored the runtime. What is a debugger? How do you step through a network, at least high speeds, and in some meaningful way, right? Even specifications are problems. So Sharon, even if we knew everything, right, it's not scalable if you have to save every pair that reaches. But often we find that we have a notion of types, customer VMs, you know, like privilege controllers, and there's a, you can do it in terms of types and which types it right, which is the most scalable. So there's all these notions that we need to work out, right, which we don't know how to do. All right, so I think therefore network verification is this confluence or meeting point between two streams of ideas, networking and PL verification. And it's made compelling by the fact that services are rising, right? So therefore, people care now, suddenly, which they never cared before. And hopefully, there are some new ideas, right? The new ideas I hope I told you about are things like the difference of cubes, remember? And compared to BDDs, they're word parallel. Can you remember that we are factoring the symmetries? It's not just symmetries on the transition graph, but symmetries on the header separately, producted with symmetries on the, on the actual physical topology. And the notion of sufficient reconfigurability, you don't want FPGAs, you just want just enough reconfigurability. And finally, that the strongly connected component impacts so space and not time, right? And that's it, it's done. And the inflection point, I hope you will, the one thing I hope you will do is believe that it's not just that we are going to simply make calls to our favorite tools in the PL community. We have this intellectual opportunity to rethink the whole thing to look inside the black boxes, to scramble together and discover together. And that's what's so exciting. The working chip for the billion transistors are there, right? So what about large networks? It's a big moonshot, right? To get these large networks completely synthesized, but what the heck, let's try. Okay? It's better to fail spectacularly than to yeah, work. <laughs> Thanks so much. So these are my co-authors. Some of them are Sophians, and some of them are Horites, right? I don't dare shorten that last form, but but uh, <laughs> but, but 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 nevertheless, there are uh, uh, the, the just various sets of so many people that I, you know, just easier to, to put it up. All right. Are there any additional questions? Yeah. So I have two questions. Yeah. Um, so a lot. Uh, you talk a lot about enabling this sort of reachability in, in some ways in a static, fairly static. Perfect, context. yes, very static. So I want to take you towards the direction of more dynamic settings and adaptation in these settings. A lot of times when packets or messages or data flows through networks, you're not just looking at the headers, you want to look at the content. And so how do these techniques need to be modified for Maybe apply when you have to actually look at the content to transform the content in addition to deciding how to transform the path. Okay. So let me answer your question in two parts. Right? First of all, there's lots of levels of dynamism before you even get to content. Routes right. change, and so there's the routing control. So that's another level. Next, you have to go ahead and uh, worry about dynamic stuff in runtime, right? So in runtime, we build these testers, which I haven't talked about, where you figure out what kind of test packets to exercise in the test. Of all these methods, I think only the test generation will work for content, right? I don't believe the static model. Maybe they will if there's some very, very small scale. It was maybe for information. Yeah, so it might be, but just I worry about the explosion problem. So we haven't tried. That. So the second question is often you're not talking about one type of network today. Yes. You're talking about data going from wire to wireless and different types of wireless networks and packets and messages flowing across them. Yes. In which case the rules that you have change very differently. Dynamically no. as you go along. No, at this level of abstraction, right, they don't, right? They're all longest matching prefix and ACL. At this level of abstraction, right? The rules are just their models, their firewalls, their load bar, they all look the same at this level. So it depends if you go to the phi level and you look at that level of abstraction, then you will see differences. But we don't actually abstract out all the link interfaces. We don't even see that. There's enough of so look, there's always bugs at every layer. And it's great to catch bugs at every layer. It's just, we're just trying to pick something which seems to matter and catch them, right? But you're totally right. There could be bugs in the MAC protocol, which are different from bugs in IP. And we're not even trying to catch those bugs. We are really trying to catch rule misplacements that people have done wrong. <coughs> right, so it's, it's, it's about, not necessarily about finding bugs, 
but also about being able to exploit these rules to be able to, for example, choose different types of routes. That would be the next step, right? That would be synthesis or something like that. Right. So, but 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 first, you know, most people in programming languages realize that synthesis is strictly harder than than analysis because you have to search through a space, an additional space of programs. Right. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Anybody else? Yes. Okay. So, somewhat related to what Malini asked, it sounds like a topology is fixed in what we discussed. Very so good. It's given in the uh, Very analysis. Good. Do you think there is room for it on the synthesis part, or is not interesting in practice? So it affects your transfer function. Right. Um, right. So that's a really good point. Okay. Classically, there are two schools of verification. One school, which is like model checking, which is just search, right? And that one, you need to fix the topology. It's hard to argue across the board. There's another style, which actually, ironically, is horror style. In, you know, where things like Koch and theorem provers. That one, actually, there's been some progress where you can argue across topologies. Right. That would be a really nice thing, but it requires a lot of human input. You have to specify reachability invariance and work. So for, for synthesis, I don't see how maybe you could generalize across topologies. But for now, I think it's hard enough, given a topology, given your reachability, just do it. But it would be you know, the next level of, uh, of excitement if you can do that. So, so everybody, it's baby steps right now. I think of where programming language verification was 15 years ago. And this is this Greenfield area. Okay. All right, why don't we uh, stop there and uh, thank our speaker once again.